Good evening, everyone. I think I'm going to begin if that's okay with all of you. My name is Marty Schickman, and I'm director of Eastern Michigan University's Center for Jewish Studies. And I would like to welcome you here tonight for the first of our 2020-2021 lecture series. Uh, every year, the Center for Jewish Studies tries to put together a lecture series that people will find compelling and, and often case challenging. And I'm hoping this year that our series will be both of those things. Uh, our opening two lectures deal with cultural difference. And cultural difference, as you know, from what we have seen given current events, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, has indeed been an enormous challenge. Today's lecture, From Rivalry to Reconciliation, the Catholic Church and the Jewish People, deals with one of, of the oldest challenging cultural differences. And I have asked Andre Villanueva to, uh, Andre Villanueva, I believe it's pronounced, and I, I apologize for the mispronunciation. I've asked him to come here today and speak about it. I will introduce him in a moment. I uh, saw him speak at a conference put on by Brandeis University, and I was extremely impressed by, uh, by his charisma and, and, and his articulateness in dealing with what is a very, very difficult issue. But I'd also like to tell you about some upcoming lectures. Please note that our second annual Art and Mary Schumann lecture is on Wednesday, September 23rd at 7 o'clock p.m. And that is Naftali Aklam, who is an Ethiopian Israeli Jew. And he will talk about being Black, Jewish, and Israeli, and the various kinds of difficulties presented by being an African man in a largely Ashkenazi country. Uh, again, that lecture is on Wednesday, September 23rd at 7 o'clock p.m. And uh, we have already put out uh, a number of, of ads for it, but there will be more coming out and uh, you will have an opportunity to be on Zoom for that one as well. Our third lecture is on Monday, October 19. And that will be a conversation with Kenneth Wald. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Wald is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Political Science and Samuel Shorstein Professor Emeritus of American Jewish Culture and Society at the University of Florida. <coughs> he is author of Religion and Politics in the United States and the Foundations of American Jewish Liberalism. Uh, he should be a very, very interesting lecture right before our election. Uh, he'll be interviewed by our very own Jeffrey Bernstein of Political Science, and I think you will find that one a bit of a delight. Uh, again, that's October 19th at 7 o'clock p.m. We have even more lectures coming this semester, but we're still firming those up. So let me tell you a bit about today. First, I would like to thank uh, the Jewish Studies Community Board, without whom my job is impossible. And, and whose kindness and patience uh, I can never say enough about. I would like to thank our friends and donors who, who make all of this possible. This, our program, our student travel, everything we do they make possible. And I hope that you might be willing to join them in the not too distant future. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Jesse Kaufman, Joe Cecilla, and Mark Witters, who have been making this lecture available to various Catholic churches in our area and who I hope have members that are here tonight. Because this is a webinar, it's difficult for you to ask questions. So your questions will be answered at the end of the lecture. And I don't know if we'll have time for all of them, but Dr. Villeneuve will answer some of them. If you would like to post questions, please click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. It is in the center portion. It says Q&A, and uh, we will answer that. Uh, I hope to have this lecture recorded tonight, and it will be put up on the EMU Center for Jewish Studies YouTube page, 
And I believe that uh, we will also link to that from the EMU Center for Jewish Studies Facebook page. This is all in the hands of my brilliant undergraduate assistant, Cole Nelson, who is moderating this event. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming and I appreciate your being here. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Andre Villeneuve. He is a Catholic biblical scholar and assistant professor in the Honors College at Azusa Pacific University in California. He holds an MA in theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville, a PhD in religious studies from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and the licentate in sacred scripture from the Pontifical Biblical Commission in Rome. His scholarly focus is on biblical theology, Jewish-Christian relations, and the reconciliation of Israel and the church. He is a founder and director of Catholics for Israel. I think you will find what he has to say exciting and challenging. You may not agree with it all, but I think you will find it very compelling. Dr. Andre Villeneuve. Thank you, Marty, for the very, very kind introduction. So uh, I can't say it's good to see you all because I don't. And um, I was just talking to Marty before we started, and we we're talking about the various risks of being involved in uh, Jewish Catholic dialogue. And when you try to be a bridge builder, you always run the risk of offending everyone equally. And uh, so I thought I would start with a high risk um, situation here as we begin this presentation by telling a joke telling a joke when I can't even see my audience. So I won't even know if you're rolling your eyes, if you're smiling or whatever, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So the only caveat I decide to tell you in advance that it's, it's a joke, just, just in case. So it goes like this, about uh, a couple of centuries ago, uh, you know the relationships between the Jews and Christians has, have, been, have not been easy. So the Pope decided a couple of centuries ago that all Jews had to leave the Vatican. So of course, there was a big uproar in the Jewish community. So the Pope decided to make a deal. He said, okay, I'm gonna have a religious debate with a uh, member of the Jewish community. If the Jew wins the, the debate, then the Jews can remain in Rome. And if the Pope wins the debate, then all the Jews have to leave. So the Jews decide, well, we have no choice. We have to do this. So they picked this one middle-aged man uh, named Moshe to represent them. So Moshe had a, uh, a request. He said, all right, we're going to have the debate, but to make it more challenging and interesting, neither side will be allowed to talk. So the Pope agreed. So the day the great debate arrives and Moshe and the Pope, they sit in front of each other on uh, in St. Peter's Square for a full minute, staring at each other. And then the Pope suddenly raises his hand and shows three fingers. Without batting an eye, Moshe looks at him and points, points one finger like this. Then the Pope goes like this. He waves his fingers in the air above him. And then Moshe points to the ground where he was sitting. Then all of a sudden the Pope pulls out a wafer and a cup and shows it to Moshe. And then Moshe pulls out a bag, pulls out an apple and shows it to the Pope. At this point, the Pope, the Pope says, I give up, this man is too good. The Jews can stay. So everybody's stunned. About an hour later, all the cardinals are gathering around the Pope and asking him, uh, Your Holiness, what happened? What happened? So the Pope says, uh, First, I held up three fingers to represent the Holy Trinity. But uh, he responded by showing me one finger, saying that there's still one God between all of us. Then I waved all my fingers around me to say that God is all around us. But he responded by pointing his finger to the ground and saying that God is right here where we are. So I pulled out the wine and the wafer to say that God wants communion with us. But he pulled out an apple to remind me of original sin. The man had an answer to everything. He was just too good. What could I do? So at the same time, the Jewish community is crowding around Moshe and asking, what happened? What happened? So Moshe says, well, first he told me that Jews had three days to get out of here. So I told him, not one of us is moving. <laughs> then he said, this whole city is going to be clear of Jews. And I said, we're staying right here. And then they're going, 
And then what? And then what? Asked a woman. So Moshe says, I don't know. He took out his lunch, so I took out mine. All right, I'm going to assume all, all of you guys are laughing. This is just the worst. It's like you're telling a joke to your own screen. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Okay, I get one person saying that it was good in the, the talk back. Thank you very much, Mary Wakefield. Okay, well, good. I'm going to share my screen. Father Ed Fried says it's only moderately amusing. Father Ed Fried, we need to talk afterwards. All right, I'm going to share my screen. I have lots to... Uh, to present and to talk about tonight. So from rivalry to reconciliation, the Catholic Church and the Jewish people. We know it's been a tormented, a very difficult relationship, but it's also a relationship that has changed quite a bit, uh, especially in the last century, not even a century really. And so I think we have much to be thankful for. When we speak of Jews and Christians, we know what is odd is that both Judaism and Christianity started really in the same place, starting with, uh, with the Bible, with the Tanakh, what the Jews call the Tanakh, what Christians call the Old Testament. But through this figure of uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, really a figure that was meant to be uniting, it led to a great division. And so today we have two completely different worlds uh, where we have uh, these kind of symbols and, uh, and, uh, and signs uh, that are very different from this kind of world. Right, And so I've been navigating both worlds, living in Israel for a long time, and sometimes even in Jerusalem, you have both worlds living side by side, but knowing very little about one another. So what I want to do today is do kind of a quick survey of uh, the history of Jewish-Christian relations, and even starting way back in the Bible to look at some of the biblical data, and then we're going to see how things have uh, evolved, devolved, and then greatly improved in the last half century or so. So at the foundation of the Bible, um, not going to give a whole Bible uh, history here, but we know it's the story of the covenants. We know there's the drama of uh, God who creates man, his image and likeness, and then uh, uh, man messes up, sin enters into the world through this rebellion against God. And the whole story of the Bible is really the story of redemption, where as you can see on the screen, we see a series of covenants that grow progressively greater. So from Adam being the husband of a marriage, we see Noah, who's the father of a household. So God kind of resets creation with uh, the flood, according to the biblical narrative. Then Abraham is called out to become the chieftain of a tribe who begins to form a certain people. And of course, as father of Isaac and then of Jacob, they become the 12 tribes of Israel. We come to the book of Exodus. Moses is the judge of a nation. And uh, so God forms this covenant people through which he will become uh, this people will become a mediator of God's redemption. And then much later in the Tanakh, we have the establishment of the Davidic kingdom, where David is king of the kingdom of Israel. Um, and so Israel becomes uh, this, this mediating people, this kingdom of priests and holy nation, uh, called to be a, a light to all the nations. So we know that through this call of Israel to become a light to, to the nations, there was one prophecy in the book of Jeremiah that will become ironically, a very controversial prophecy, and one that, in fact, divides Jews and Christians, and that is, of course, the prophecy of the new covenant. Uh, prophet Jeremiah prophesies that God will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the former covenant, but this will be a covenant uh, where the Lord will put, he says, I will put my law within them, I will write it upon their hearts, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So some kind of internalization of the Sinai covenant. And of course, we know the New Testament authors see this as coming to pass with the birth of a little Jewish boy called uh, Yeshua, Jesus, born in Bethlehem and who grows up in Nazareth. So the uh, Gospel of Luke speaks of Simeon, a uh, Jewish elder who says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. So ironically, this figure of Jesus will become called to be a uniting figure, actually will become a, a dividing figure between uh, Jews and Christians. So the Gospels present Jesus as really fulfilling all the history of Israel. He's portrayed as a new Adam who is also tempted in a garden, uh, but uh, sir, um, overcomes the temptation unlike the first Adam. He is also a new son of Abraham, who just like Isaac was offered on the altar, he will be offered as sacrifice. The Gospel of John especially portrays him as a prophet like Moses, and really all prophet, all the Gospels portray Jesus entering Jerusalem as a son of David. He's acclaimed as, uh, as son of David. 
So the New Testament portrays Jesus as this kind of recapitulation of the story of Israel. And if you look at an example of some of the major moments in the history of Israel, we know Israel came out of, uh, came out of Egypt through the wilderness. They crossed the Red Sea. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. They received the Torah on Mount Sinai. God provided the manna for them. And then there is your Davidic kingdom. So especially the Gospel of Matthew will recapitulate these events in the life of Jesus. So Jesus flees to Egypt when he is an infant. He crosses the waters of the Jordan where he is baptized. He spends 40 days in the wilderness being tempted. And then he goes on the Mount of Beatitudes to deliver a, a new interpretation of the Torah to his people. He multiplies loaves and distributes this bread to his people, a new type of manna, himself saying, I am the bread of life. As we said, he uh, portrays, he is portrayed as the, uh, the, the king of Israel who enters Jerusalem. So Jesus, as at the Last Supper, also kind of appropriates the prophecy of the new covenant by Jeremiah, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So we're talking about a Pesach Seda, uh, Passover meal, where he basically kind of takes the Passover and typologically reinterprets it to become the anticipation of his own sacrifice when his blood as Lamb of God is poured out. And at the Last Supper, he appoints the 12 apostles to judge over the 12 tribes of Israel. So all this is basic kind of New Testament data. We know that Jesus, ironically, coming as the king of the Jews, apparently says that Jerusalem did not recognize the time of her own visitation, and so he's rejected by his own. Um, the Gospels quote Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And he is led to the cross where he is um, crucified, brutally executed by the Romans. And the New Testament authors will see this as basically the new sacrifice, the sacrifice of the new covenant. As you can see on the illustration here, kind of recapitulating all the history of, uh, of Israel. So the gospel writers, of course, also report that Jesus is raised from the dead. And by this, in this way, he fulfills all the previous covenants and opens the way back to heaven to win eternal life. So that's your nutshell a gospel 101 uh, overview. So when we come to the book of the Acts of the Apostles on Shavuot, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the apostles. And so the proclamation of the apostles Two, of course, the Jews who are gathered in Jerusalem is that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucify, repent, be baptized, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and so on. So they proclaim this good news that apparently the Messiah has come, inviting all to follow him. So at first we know that this is not a Gentile religion. This is entirely a Jewish affair. This is apparently a Messiah who has come, who has mysteriously died, who was raised and has come to, uh, to redeem his people, Israel. So the church at first is not some kind of Gentile identity. It's supposed to be the fulfillment of all promises made to Israel. And indeed, all the first Christians are Jews. The, the early church is entirely Jewish until this one Roman centurion, Cornelius, is, uh, is baptized by Peter. And so we have this first controversy in the history of the church like it's not should Jews become Christians it's more like can Gentiles become Christians and do Gentiles first need to become Jews before they become Christians and the early church decides overwhelmingly no the Gentiles do not need to become Jews before they they come to faith in Christ so they can become Christians without having to have the Brit Milah I'm sure they were glad about that so no no circumcision and then no obligation to observe the Torah on the other hand, which is often forgotten by Christians, is that Jewish Christians also never cease to be Jews. You'll find that in Acts 21. So you see this early church has a type of point of reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles, where Jews can remain Jews, they believe in the Messiah, Gentiles remain Gentiles, and they also believe in the Messiah. So what went wrong if this church was supposed to be this point of reconciliation? What does the New Testament say about this? If we move to Paul and Paul's epistles, because we know, as we'll see, that um, the church very soon started to have a very different attitude towards Israel and the Jewish people. So if we go to the Apostle Paul, who wrote a good part of the New Testament, he raises this question, has God rejected his people Israel? Emphatically, he says, by no means. And of course, the, uh, the early Christians are dealing with this problem, that theological problem for them, that 
most Jews are, end up not accepting uh, Jesus as Messiah. So he's saying, okay, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means, but through their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So as to make Israel jealous, for if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their, their acceptance be but life from the dead? So Paul in the epistle to the Romans speaks of a certain hardening upon Israel until the full number of Gentiles has come in and so all Israel will be saved. And he's saying, yes, they seem, they appear to be enemies of the gospel, but as regards election, they're still beloved for the sake of their ancestors, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So clearly we see the beginning of tension right there in the New Testament between those who accept Jesus, those who reject him, but despite this tension, uh, Paul is very clear that God has not rejected Israel and that it's part of God's mystery somehow that uh, the gospel will go to the Gentiles. So what happens after the New Testament? We know that um, when Jesus died, the, the veil of the temple is torn, signifying, uh, according to the, the gospel of Matthew, some kind of change in worship. And in 60, 66 to 73, the great Jewish-Roman war, which is going to lead to the destruction of the temple and a reconfiguration of Judaism that becomes focused on the Torah and on, on the synagogue, on prayer, rather than on sacrifices. So it's going to be a traumatic time for the Jews, end of the first and beginning of the second century. The Bar Kokhba revolt, a second revolt that is also crushed against the Romans so that Jews become exiled from uh, Jerusalem, which is renamed Aelia Capitolina by Emperor Hadrian. And uh, that's going to be the beginning or continuation of the diaspora for the next uh, 18 centuries. So we leave this, uh, the first and second century, and then we want to see really quickly what happened in, the, in this relationship between, uh, between Jews and Christians. So this is what is known in scholarship as the so-called parting of the ways. So we see a gradual increase in the number of Gentiles in the church when most Jews at this point reject Jesus. And those early Christians who were really Jewish Christians, they become kind of stuck in the middle. Uh, the Jewish community rejects them because they believe in Jesus, but also the Gentile Christians don't really like them because they're still holding on to, uh, to Judaism. So by the time we get to the time of Constantine, who legalizes Christianity, those Jewish communities have largely uh, disappeared and Christianity becomes now a Gentile religion. That's when things will really change in the relationship between Jews and Christians, where we have, as the title goes, the parting of the ways, uh, two religions that grow entirely separately and in fact in hostility to one another. So we're in the time of the church fathers, at first, uh, the Jews persecute the early church when the Christians are weak, but with the rise of the Byzantine em Empire, when uh, Constantine is, uh, legalizes Christianity, we see the church fathers who begin this theological and polemical offensive against Judaism. So in their writings, of course, it's a battle for truth, right? Did the Messiah come? Did he not come? And uh, so they have to kind of build an apologetic case for um, Christianity, and so they're going to do this by literally attacking Judaism. And this is what we know as the as either the theology of substitution or replacement theology. It's also known as um, as supersessionism. So, what is the the uh, the gist of this theology? Well, it is that the church is now the new and the true Israel, and God has therefore revoked His election of Israel because the church fathers say because Israel has rejected Christ, therefore God has rejected. Uh, Israel. The Jews have no more, moreover, they have rejected and killed Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, they are Christ killers who are guilty of deicide. Pretty serious accusation. So to, to kill God, it, it uh, takes talent. I guess we could we'd come up with a lot of good jokes on that one there, which have been made, but I'm going to leave this one for someone else. So a serious accusation that the Jews, this uh, accusation of being Christ killers begins basically in the third and fourth century. And also the Old Testament curses become, so say the church fathers, directed towards the Jews, whereas all the promises of the Tanakh of the Old Testament are now spiritualized and they are seized by the church. So kind of a problematic way of exegeting the Bible here. It's like, okay, the Jews can have the curses and we're going to have the blessings that Isaiah and Jeremiah pronounced. So you can see that this um, really laid kind of theological foundation that would cause big problems along the line. Um, 
It's important to say this never became the official theology of the church, but it was certainly very prevalent and very widespread in, in Christian theology. So another very interesting imagery is that of Jacob and, and Esau. We know the story, uh, the two brothers, the, two, the twins, when um, Rebecca in the book of Genesis receives this prophecy that two nations are in your womb, two people shall be separated from your body, one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So we're going to see Jews and Christians trying to appropriate the person of Jacob. So of course, this, as the story goes, Jacob steals the birthright and the blessing from Esau. And it ends up, the prophet Malachi says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So of course, who wants to be Esau? Nobody. Everybody wants to be Jacob. So Jacob has to flee from Esau, and Esau is the bad guy who wants to kill uh, Jacob. So both Jews and Christians theologically are going to try to associate with Jacob. The Jews, of course, have the good case for the literal sense, because, of course, Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the Jews say, yeah, of course, we're Jacob and Esau, which became a symbol of Rome. Esau represents Christianity, so the big bad brother who's trying to kill us all the time. So that's what uh, Jews say. Christians say, no, 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 you guys don't get it. We're the younger son. We were born after you, but we kind of grabbed the blessing from you, the blessing that you were supposed to have. So actually, we're Jacob, and you, Israel, you're Esau, you're the older brother who's trying to, to kill us, you, you know, the, the nascent uh, church. So tug of war, who is really Jacob and who is Esau? That's going to last for a good part of, um, of Christian history. So here I get into maybe what is more controversial, uh, the more controversial part of this presentation is that as we're going to see, both Jewish and Christian theologians have talked about a type of passion of Israel, just as Christ went through a passion and was uh, rejected and, uh, and, and beaten and led to his execution to the cross. Uh, their theologians have also proposed that Israel went through a similar uh, journey through their history. And uh, not, not to begin with this kind of presenting this as a wild Christian idea, but probably some of you are familiar with this, uh, this painting from Marc Chagall, who portrays uh, the Jesus, uh, the Jewish Jesus wearing a talit on the cross, and he's surrounded by Jews suffering from, from pogroms and uh, being killed and uh, escaping from their towns, being exiled. And so Chagall wanted to represent basically the Jewish people somehow participating in this, uh, this suffering of, uh, of Christ. And of course, Christian theologians will go in that direction too. But I'm aware that many Jews don't like that image at all. They're saying, Christians, you stick to your theology and uh, don't try to, to, to make us, to associate us with Christ since we've suffered so much uh, uh, at the hands of Christians. So but nevertheless, this is something that uh, theologians on both sides, especially on the Christian side, have proposed. So, okay, so um, really quickly, as I said, I don't have time to go through the whole history of Jewish-Christian relations, but some highlights or lowlights. St. Augustine, the great, perhaps the greatest of the church fathers, says that the Jews are a witness people now that the Messiah has come. So the Jews must not be harmed, they must not be killed, but their survival and humiliation and hardship gives witness to Christian truth by their dispersion and woes. So Augustine was adamant that Jews should not be harmed, Christians should not harm them, but the very fact that they are now exiled from Israel is kind of a testimony to the truth of Christianity. So from this kind of theology, which uh, obviously is problematic, we're going to see increasingly oppressive anti-Jewish legislation. So at first it's just like kind of theology, theology in books, but we're going to see as Christianity gains more power, we're going to see anti-Jewish legislation increasing near the end of antiquity. So we're going to see acts of violence, the compulsory listening of Christian sermons, forced baptisms, and so on. Christians, of course, are always going to try to convert Jews to Christianity, but when they convert Jews to Christianity, they want to completely uproot them from Judaism. And so no wonder they had no great success um, by, uh, uh, by trying to kind of uproot Jews from everything that they held dear. To be fair, many popes, bishops, and kings defended and tried to protect the Jews, most notably Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th, 7th century. But there were all, many, very often, the popes were actually the friends of the Jews, and very often it was kind of lower level clergy and uh, the populace uh, 
uh, that had kind of a, a popular type of anti-Judaism. And I say anti-Judaism because it's, uh, scholars agree that at first it was really a religious anti-Judaism. It was not a racial type of discrimination. In other words, if Jews convert to Christianity, it's like, yay, you're our friends now. So we don't care about your blood, about your race. What we care is that you don't believe in the truth, you reject the Messiah. And so at first, at least, it was theological anti-Judaism. But we know that in the modern age, it's going to turn into racial anti-Semitism. So Christian anti-Judaism persists and, in fact, gets worse through the Middle Ages. We have, of course, the uh, sad episode of the Crusades, where you have Jews who are massacred, both in Germany and along the Rhine. Bishops, local bishops, again, tried to protect them, Sometimes, some of them successfully, others unsuccessfully. The, uh, the terrible history of ritual murders and blood libels, so Jews accused of killing Christian children to get their blood to make the, the, the matzah, the Passover unleavened bread. Of course, it's ludicrous. Anyone who knows anything about Jewish law would know that this is absolutely uh, absurd because, of course, it's forbidden to eat or drink blood in Judaism. So once again, many popes try to exonerate Jews from the charges. They say there's no foundation for these accusations, but still they were very prevalent uh, throughout the Middle Ages. Time of the Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisition did not pursue or persecute Jews as such, but they persecuted the Moranos, who were the Jewish converts. Um, so uh, again, a sad chapter in, uh, in Jewish-Christian relations. Uh, again, it's a pope who's going to suspend the Inquisition against the Moranos, be becoming aware that there were some serious abuses that were being done there. Jews will be kicked out from many, if not most, Western European countries, and they will go and resettle in the East, so Poland, Ukraine, and, uh, and Russia to some extent as well. So as quick as a survey as I could do of the Middle Ages, I've taught a whole course on Jewish Christian relations where we go into the details, but uh, I go through the bad stuff to show how much, uh, how much things have improved. So, but we come to the modern age, so with the Enlightenment, you would think that things would have gotten better, but no, when the Jews who were kicked out from Western Europe moved to Eastern Europe, they're resettled in ghettos in Eastern Europe. And so despite emancipation and assimilation, so at this point, there's a rise of Reformed Judaism and Jews become more secular, trying to integrate and assimilate even to, to the countries in which they live, Anti-Semitism still persists in the modern world, and this is when we see um, religious anti-Judaism turning into racial anti-Semitism. So with modern race theories, uh, especially in, in Prussia, we know what that's going to become. Uh, we see a, a kind of a morphing of this theological religious anti-Judaism into something where it didn't matter anymore if you were a Jew who converted to Christianity. You still have Jewish blood, and that's the essence of the problem. So that's going to be this new uh, racial anti-Semitism. Near the end of the 19th century, we have terrible pogroms in Russia. You've seen uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, you have kind of a, a bit of a snapshot of that. And uh, so it's, it's a grueling history. It's a grueling history. There are many good stories as well, but for sure they are uh, few and far between. Um, some, uh, some terrible things that, uh, that happen in the history of Jewish-Christian relations. So in the midst of all this, we know that the Jewish people maintain hope and they survived quite incredibly through centuries, um, maintaining hope to return to the land that God promised to them. Even Jesus said, uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, see your house is left to you desolate. And Jesus said that Jerusalem would be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So uh, impl implying that there will be a time when the time of the Gentiles over Jerusalem will come to an end. And so at every Passover, as you know, if you're Jewish, the Jewish families keep saying next year in Jerusalem. And so throughout history, they have this longing and this hope that God would not abandon them and return them to, uh, to the land of the promise. And that is, of course, sustained throughout the prophets. Ezekiel 11, for example, Though I remove them far away among the nations, and though I scatter them among the countries, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of all the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. It's actually one of the, probably the most repeated prophecy in, in the Old Testament, uh, the, this promise of returning the Jewish people to the land of Israel. 
So many Christians have become aware of that. Others don't. Uh, others uh, are not really aware of this, this divine promise of, uh, uh, of God through the prophets to uh, restore Israel to their land. So how did the church respond to this? Um, if I could see you or hear you, I would quiz you on who is this guy, who is this pope. But I can't, so. Very good, you got it. Uh, just kidding. So this is Pope Pius X, who met Theodor Herzl, so the founder of, Ju of uh, Zionism, in 1904. And so um, in the midst of pogroms and Russia and so on, Herzl tried to get support from, from the Pope for, uh, for Zionism, for the project of the Jews to return back to the Palestine or the land of Israel. And Pius X's response was curt and not very friendly. He said, non possumus, we cannot. We are unable to favor this movement of Zionism. We cannot prevent the Jews from going to Jerusalem, but we could never sanction it. The ground of Jerusalem, if it were not always sacred, has been sanctified by the life of Jesus Christ. The Jews have not recognized our Lord, therefore we cannot recognize the Jewish people. So kind of emblematic of the attitudes, um, Pius X was not an anti-Semite, but he was certainly not a, a Zionist. And so that was pretty much the established theology um, among, among Catholics up until not too long ago that basically the Jews have rejected Jesus. Therefore, God has kicked them out of the land of Israel and, uh, and, and that's it. So there was this belief in Christianity that uh, Israel you know, will never return to the Jewish people. So they were in for a little surprise, not, uh, not uh, long after, because we know that the movement of the return to the Jews started around that time. In fact, they had already started previously. So this long and grueling history of anti-Semitism, of course, leads to the uh, terrifying and uh, horrific final solution of, of Hitler in, um, with, uh, with Nazi Germany, so the ex extermination of uh, two-thirds of European Jewry. So I understand we have some Holocaust students here in the audience, and so I will not get into the details of that, but want to move on to, uh, to the theology of what, what has happened with the Holocaust. And so as terrifying and as unjustifiable as the Shoah, uh, as Jews call the Holocaust, can be, we know that it has shaken the Christian world in many ways. And um, we might say it's maybe a risky proposition to make that the Holocaust is what has shaken Christian theology enough to say, hey, maybe we really need to rethink about what we've been saying about the Jewish people for most of Christian history. So this is where we find some Christian philosophers and theologians who say something that uh, probably some Jews will not like so much, but nevertheless is something that has transformed uh, Christian attitudes. So people like Jacques Maritain, the French, um, French Catholic philosopher. So again, here you see a painting uh, from Chagall of Jesus together with his people who are persecuted, the Jewish people. So Maritain said, the passion of Israel is more and more taking the shape of the cross. So he speaks of this idea of the passion of Israel. There's kind of a mystery in the suffering of the Jewish people through history. But he says also the agony of the Jews is one in which Christ participates. So somehow that, um, that, that Christ has not uh, rejected his people or he, he has not have, had the arrogant attitude that many Christians have had. Others such as Father Edward, Edward Flannery who was a priest and who wrote the first history of uh, Christian anti-Semitism in the 1960s. And so this was remarkable for a Catholic priest who, uh, to soberly review this history of, uh, of how Christians have not treated Jews very well. And so he writes in his book, uh, his book is called The Anguish of the Jews. He wrote, was not this the supreme defection that the most severely and persistently persecuted of Christian history were not those to whom persecution was promised by the master, but rather the people from which he came. In other words, Jesus promised his disciples that they would be persecuted, the Christians. But Flannery says, actually, the Christians were not the ones who were persecuted the most, not the disciples of, of Jesus, but actually the people from whom he came. The Jews actually suffered more than, than Christians, ironically. Flannery also says, some have perceived in the hatred of the Jew an unconscious hatred of Christ, a rebellion against the Christian yoke no longer found sweet, in a word, a Christophobia. Incapable of hating Christianity openly, the Christian anti-Semite 
through an unconscious displacement of effect, diverts his animus to the Jews, kinsmen of his, its founder. So what does he mean by that? So Christian anti-Semites have al always said, oh, Jews are the Christ killers, the Jews rejected Jesus, but we love Jesus, and so therefore we're going to, you know, uh, we're going to kill the Jews, or we're going to, to persecute them. Flannery says, no, 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 Christians, Christian anti-Semites, you don't love Jesus, you actually hate Jesus, and because you're not able to, like, beat up on Jesus, because he's not here anymore, you're going to beat up the Jews, because Jesus came from the Jews. And so he proposed that Christian anti-Semites are really uh, violating their own Christian identity. So if you think this is a terrible Christian theory, so Maurice Samuel, who is a Jewish philosopher, said something very similar. He said, anti-Semites must spit on the Jews as the Christ killers because they long to spit on the Jews as the Christ givers. In other words, anti-Semites are the worst Christians because they, they spit on the, the people who gave them uh, who they believe is their Messiah. All right, so a lot of information. Uh, what do we do with all this? So the passion of Israel, we see this, this gruesome history of the Jewish people since the destruction of the temple through the Inquisition and on their way to, uh, to Auschwitz, some uh, these Christian philosophers have said there is a lot of resemblances actually in this so-called passion of Israel with the way of, of the cross of Jesus uh, going on his way to his, his crucifixion. And so they say that just as the Sanhedrin treated and rejected Jesus, so the church, without even realizing it, the church kind of did the same thing to, to the Jewish people, thinking they were so righteous, but in fact, they were acting like this unjust tri tribunal. Uh, here we see the picture of the, the Inquisition, for example. And so it's a theological mystery that is probably uncomfortable for, for our Jewish listeners, but it's also uncomfortable probably for our Christian listeners. So as I said, you deal with Jewish Christian relations, you get, you get hated by all people equally. So hopefully there won't be any discrimination there. So it's, it's an uncomfortable theory, which you can accept or reject. And uh, to add more to controversial proposals, we know that in 1945, we see a type of death of Israel, right? As they are uh, barely, uh, I mean, many are, are, uh, lose their life in Auschwitz, but we know that three years later, we see a type of resurrection with the, against all odds, we see the Zionist movement uh, propelled by a narrow window of sympathy on the part of the nations. This makes possible the establishment of the state of Israel. And so a type of resurrection three years after the type of crucifixion of Israel. And this is going to be a shock for for everyone, obviously, including the Jewish people, but for especially for Christians who hold to replacement theology, saying that, well, God has rejected Israel and that's it, right? He's rejected the Jewish people. Augustine's theory of uh, the Jews as slave librarians, so by their humiliation, they're testifying to, uh, to the truth of Christianity. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean the Jews are, are, are founding their country again? That doesn't work with our theology. And so it's a great challenge theologically for Christians. We know there were a few forerunners already before the foundation of the state of Israel. During the Holocaust, Pope Pius XI uh, condemned na Nazi ideology of racism with his encyclical Mit Brenner der Sorge, the only encyclical ever written in German. And Pius XI also said famously, anti-Semitism is unacceptable. Spiritually, we are all Semites. Uh, meaning Christians, because we have inherited our faith from, uh, from Judaism. Pope Pius XII, controversial during World War II, many witnesses say that he actually worked behind the scenes. He is criticized for his silence, of course, and his silence is a problem. Uh, but many say, including some Jewish friends of Pius XII, who say he actually worked behind the scenes, donating gold to the Vatican to save uh, thousands of Jews from the Nazis. So we're still awaiting for the opening of the Vatican archives to, uh, to pass the final verdict on Pius XII. But we know that there were forerunners who really opposed at least the terrible anti-Semitism of the Nazis. And so after World War II, the one who's really going to start changing the direction is Pope John XXIII. But a short pont pontificate, just five years, he was apostolic delegate in Turkey during uh, World War II 
And for sure, we know that he saved uh, thousands of Jews from the Nazis. So lo and behold, he calls this ecumenical council, which is going to become the second Vatican council in the early 60s, and he began officially a policy of Jewish Christian reconciliation, beginning with changing the Good, Good Friday prayer for the Jews, which had kind of derogatory words against the Jewish people. So he actually got angry and told them, uh, told cardinals or whoever was in charge that you, you have to change that prayer. This is unacceptable for us to, to pray. The prayer it referred to the Jews as the perfidious Jews, meaning really the unbelieving Jews, but it was not an acceptable term to be included in Christian prayer. He also spoke to a group of American Jews saying, I am Joseph, your brother. So he identified himself as the younger brother of uh, these American Jews. So he was very loved, a very warm, uh, smiling Pope. And so he launched this um, Second Vatican Council, which uh, led to the first official Catholic document on, on the Jewish people. In fact, it's a document on all non-Christian religions, but it started off as a document on the Jews. So what did this document Nostra Aetate affirm? Some statements that will seem totally uncontroversial today, but in the 60s, they were kind of a big deal. So it affirmed that there is a spiritual bond between Christians and the Jewish people, that the church received the Old Testament from Israel, obviously, but that the church still draws sustenance from what Paul, the Apostle Paul calls the root of the olive tree, meaning Israel. So that the church still draws her life in many ways from Israel. That Jesus has by his cross reconciled Jews and Gentiles. He did not, not come to alienate them. And the document also affirmed the divine promises to Israel and the Jewish identity of Jesus and the apostles. Like, guess what, Christians? Jesus was not a Catholic. Neither was Mary. Neither were the apostles. And Nostra Aetate also affirmed the permanent election of Israel and hope for their salvation. So their permanent election, meaning that they did not stop being the chosen people after the coming of Christ. Jews should not be blamed for the death of Christ. So quite contrary to what some of the church fathers said, they should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God. All forms of anti-Semitism are unacceptable. And that Christ died not because the Jews were bad, but because of the sins of all men and for the sake of salvation. So some propositions, Jews would still have a problem uh, believing them. Uh, did Jesus really die for the sake of salvation? But Jesus did not die because of the wickedness of the Jews, but he died because of the sins of all men uh, for the sake of salvation. So it's totally unacceptable to blame Jews for the death of Christ, because who killed Christ according to Christology, to Christian theology? I did. I'm the one who killed Christ through my sins. Okay, so I think many people have heard of Vatican II and Nostra Aetate. They know that things began to change with Nostra Aetate, but there were many other documents that were um, published after that. And I'm going to just skim over them very quickly. You may want to jot them down. They're all public domain. You can find them. If you just Google them, you can find them and read them for yourself. So in 1974, under Pope Paul VI, the guidelines and suggestions for implementing the Conciliar Declaration Nostra Aetate number no. 4, so you have to get the Catholic Church has always the catchiest titles for their documents. I mean, this makes for a real bestseller, right? So I don't even know if you're laugh, laughing or like squirming at my jokes. It's terrible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you're a good audience. So this document said, it's time to bridge this gap dividing Judaism and Christianity. It repeated that anti-Semitism is opposed to the very spirit of Christianity that we must uh, engage in dialogue, know each other's tradition, that when Christians witness to Christ, they really have to respect religious liberty and never impose the gospel on others or try to manipulate or coerce other people, especially the Jewish people, into believing. Um, liturgy, homilies, when priests and deacons preach homilies, they should never put Jews in an unfavorable light as responsible for uh, the death of Christ. A long section on education, saying that the same God speaks in both Old Testament and New Testament. So your rejection of the old heresy of Marcionism. And maybe some Christians you still know have this attitude. It's like, oh, the God of the Old Testament is kind of this angry, vengeful God, but the God of the New Testament is just so nice and merciful and, uh, and, uh, and uh, forgiving. So the church firmly rejects that. It's the same God who speaks in both. Jews should not be blamed again for the passion and death of Christ joint social action is encouraged.
So that's really very quickly in the gist, um, the gist of this 1974 document. So really the one who did the most probably for Jewish Christian relations is John Paul II, one of the longest pontificates in the history of the church. And he said famously, whoever meets Jesus Christ meets Judaism. And so if you think you encounter Jesus as the one you believe is the Messiah, then you are encountering Judaism right there. So there's no way you can claim to love Christ and, and, uh, and hate Jews. So he also spoke of this meeting between the people of the old covenant, the Jews, never revoked by God, and that of the new covenant. It's a dialogue within our church. And so when we speak as Christians, we speak with Jews. Uh, it, we're, we're really speaking with those of our own identity. So I realize this is also Jews and Christians might agree on this because, of course, Christians depend on Judaism for their theology, but Jews don't depend on Christianity for their own theology. So I know some Jews are kind of like, yeah, I mean, Christology, or I'm sorry, theology, Christian theology is not really that important for us at all. But for Christians, we must uh, encounter and engage Judaism in order to understand our own faith. So another document with a super catchy title, Notes on the Correct Way to Present Jews and Judaism and Preaching and Catechesis in the Roman Catholic Church. Repeat all this with me real quickly three times. No, just kidding. So this document, 1985, went even further uh, than the previous one. Uh, so it speaks about uh, the religious teaching and Judaism, saying that the Jews and Judaism should not occupy a, an occasional and marginal place in teaching the faith and catechesis, but their presence is essential and should be organically integrated. So if you're a Christian teaching in, at your church or in school, you know that it's not an option for us to talk about the Jews and Judaism and their role in God's plan of, of salvation, their ongoing role, not former role. Um, so knowledge of the Jewish faith and religious life as professed and practiced still today can greatly help us to better understand the life of the church, said John Paul II. So again, not portraying Judaism as kind of a fossil. It's like, yeah, we need to know, you know, the fossil to know how it evolved into the church. No, Judaism as practiced today is still of great value for us to understand God. So it's not enough to just uproot anti-Semitism, but we must deepen this bond, join, joining the church with the Jews and Judaism. So a lot, this document says a lot about the relationship between Old Testament and New Testament, saying it's true that Christians read the Old Testament differently, but still the Old Testament has its own value, which may be profitable for Christians. So we don't need to read the Old Testament just as prophecies of Christ. The Jewish reading of the Old Testament is of great value and uh, can be very informative and edifying for Christians as well, without it necessarily being a prophecy pointed to Christ. And likewise, a New Testament must be read in light of the Old Testament, the Tanakh. So, of course, the question is that we all move towards a similar goal. And as the saying goes, when the Messiah comes, uh, Jews and Christians, we will ask him, excuse me, sir, but uh, have you been here before? And so Christians ex expect the return of the Messiah, or as Jews expect the coming of, of the Messiah, or at least Jews who still believe in, uh, in their own faith. So the same 1985 documents speaks of the Jewish roots of Christianity, emphasizing that Jesus not only was, but is a Jew. Uh, the Pharisees were not always bad guys. The Jews in the New Testament, sometimes they're used as an umbrella term to refer to the adversaries of Jesus, but this should not be an excuse to refer to the Jews derogatively. Words on the lit liturgy, and perhaps the most interesting part of this, um, this document is uh, that on Judaism and Christianity in history. So for the first time, a church document dares to touch upon the question of the land of Israel that the history of Israel continued after 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, so that Israel was a witness, often heroic, of its fidelity to one God. That's something for a Catholic document to say the Jews were a heroic witness of their fidelity to the one God. It's a far cry from, from the Jews as, as Christ killers. While preserving the memory of the land of their forefathers at the hearts of their hope. So the document says, Christians are invited to understand this religious attachment, which finds its roots in biblical tradition, without, however, making their own any particular religious interpretation of this relationship. So this has to do with the land and the state of Israel. 
So the church very, very cautious. At this point, the church had not yet recognized the, the state of Israel. So this document for the first time says the existence of the state of Israel and its political option should be envisaged not in perspective, which is itself religious, but in their reference to the common principles of international law. So it's not saying, hey, this is the fulfillment of prophecy, but it's, it's saying, well, there is a legitimacy to the existence of the state of Israel. And in fact, the permanence of Israel is a historic fact and is signed to be interpreted within God's design. So it comes pretty close to saying that, well, yeah, we know that it thanks to God that the Jews have survived. So we have to rid ourselves of this idea of a people punished. That's Augustine. It remains a chosen people, the pure olive on which were grafted the branches of the wild olive, which are the Gentiles. So the 1985 notes, still a pretty major step ahead. So the John Paul II makes, takes more steps towards reconciliation. He says the Jewish religion is not extrinsic to us, but intrinsic to our religion. So visiting the great synagogue in Rome, he says that with Judaism, we have this relationship which we do not have with any other religion. You are our dearly beloved brothers. In a certain way, it could be said, you are our elder brothers. So acknowledging the kind of the elder brother part of uh, role of the, the, uh, the Jewish people. He was, he was not thinking of Esau in this case. He was not thinking of Esau. He was thinking more of Joseph, uh, I think. And in fact, fun fact, Benedict the 16th, after John Paul II, he shied away from using the elder brother metaphor uh, or analogy because he thought, well, often in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the elder brother is rejected. So we don't want to go there anymore. So John Paul II meant well by saying you're elder brothers, but Benedict kind of moved away from that. So 1993, uh, finally, it took him a while, but the Vatican establishes full diplomatic relations with the state of Israel. And John Paul II says that it was actually their right that after being dispersed for 2,000 years, um, they, have, uh, they have decided to return to the land of their ancestors. So it's their right, and therefore the church should rightly recognize uh, the existence and legitimacy of the state of Israel. Okay, still under John Paul II, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is published. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly over those texts. So this is the most authoritative manual for teaching the Catholic faith today. So a couple of paragraph, uh, paragraphs. The Catechism speaks of the Magi coming to Jerusalem when Jesus was born to pay homage to the King of the Jews. And it says that pagans can discover Jesus and worship him as son of God and savior of the world only by turning towards the Jews and receiving from them the Messianic promise as contained in the Old Testament. So Christians, if you want to get to know Jesus, you can only do this by turning towards the Jews and understanding God's purposes for them. Also, the Catechism uh, says, this, the Catechism calls the Jewish people the first to hear the word of God and the Jewish faith being already a response to God's revelation in the Old Covenant. So it quotes from the New Testament saying that to the Jews in the present, not the past, belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable, quoting the New Testament. So again, the calling of God upon the Jewish people is not revoked by the coming of Christ. John Paul also says he tackles head on this problem of erroneous and unjust of the New Testament and their alleged culpability for the death of Christ. And so he's saying there's, this is unacceptable. If you ever meet Christians who uh, still hold on to this idea that the Jews are guilty for the death of Christ, you can point them to these, um, to these documents. This was a speech to a symposium on the roots of anti-Judaism in 1997. So he says, at the origin of this little people of Israel is the act of divine election, and it's not, their survival is not a fact of nature, but a supernatural fact, because God has been watching over them, because he's faithful to his covenant with Israel. The church also tackled the question of the Shoah, so the guilt, not of Jews, but perhaps of Christians, and uh, for their silence during the Holocaust. So this 1998 document raises the question whether the Nazi persecution of the Jews was not made easier by the anti-Jewish prejudices embedded in some Christian minds and hearts. So the anti-Jewish sentiment among Christians make them less sensitive or indifferent even to the persecution launched against the Jews by the Nazis. 
Did Christians give every possible assistance? This document says many did, but others did not. So there were some courageous men and women, but there were many who were cowards and did not do uh, what they could have. And so quite remarkable, the Catholic Church in this case says in this document that the church desires to express her deep sorrow for the failures of her sons and daughters in every age. And the church uses this word, this Hebrew word of tshuva, this act of repentance, that we as Christians and Catholics, we must repent for the inaction of the members of our church because we're linked to the sins of the past of our, of our ancestors. So that too, it's been, it's been said and it needs to be repeated and that needs to be taught if you, are, if you teach in Christian churches that uh, we need to hold this attitude of humility as we relate to Judaism. So John Paul II continued in this very humble attitude of repentance when he went to the Kotel in Jerusalem in 2000. He put this prayer in the, the Kotel asking God for forgiveness. God of our fathers, you chose Abraham and his descendants to bring your name to the nations. We are deeply saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused these children of yours to suffer. And asking your forgiveness, we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. So very public uh, apology there in Jerusalem. 2001, a very long document, I won't get into it, uh, the Jewish people and their sacred scriptures and the Christian Bible, even more catchy than the other ones. That's a short one. And so again, it refutes the idea that Israel has been rejected. So that one I think has a hundred and some pages. It's quite long and very rich. So with the death of John Paul II, the path continued with Benedict XVI. He said, I wish to continue this path towards improved relations and friendship with the Jewish people, following the decisive lead given by Pope John Paul II. So Benedict also went to Israel and uh, he referred to the, the Shoah as this a crime of enormous magnitude, referred to anti-Semitism that continues to rear its ugly head in many parts of the world, and this is totally unacceptable. He spoke also of combating anti-Semitism wherever it is found. So Benedict's visits in Israel, um, 2009. So ironically, I lived in Israel for a long time, but I was in Rome when he went to Israel. What could I do? So he went to, the, to Yad Vashem, to the Holocaust Museum. And since 2013, we have Pope Francis, who is also committed to the same uh, commitment of reconciliation. So he also visited Israel in 2014. And under Pope Francis, we have the latest document published in 2015 called, based on the words of the New Testament of St. Paul, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, and referring, of course, to the gifts and calling of God to the Jewish people. So this document goes over the history. It was published for the 50 years of Nostra Aetate. So it goes over the history of Jewish Catholic dialogue and um, relationship of Old and New Testament. And it tackles also the difficult question of the universality of salvation in Jesus Christ and God's unrevoked covenant with Israel. And we know that's still a sticky point that many Jews don't like. The church has not given up her belief that Jesus is the Messiah and the author of salvation. So how can the church kind of theologically juggle these two apparent contradictions that Jesus, salvation comes through Christ, but still God has not revoked his covenant with Israel. That's kind of an ongoing big uh, theological hot potato, if you, if you will. So how does the church uh, deal with it, her mandate to evangelize in relation to Judaism? How can she do that? Can she do that? Uh, while being respectful of Judaism and dialogue with Judaism. So, okay, so to wrap things up, what can we, uh, what can we bring together in this very quick, very dense, I'm aware, uh, overview of Jewish-Christian relations? So we have definitely seen a pro-Jewish turn of the Catholic magisterium, of the Catholic Church, led by the popes, since, uh, especially since the 1960s. We see a very firm affirmation that God's covenant with Israel is irrevocable. The church also firmly uh, uh, asserts that um, the, the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, that we cannot understand the Christian faith unless we engage seriously with Judaism. The state of Israel has a right to exist in peace and security. So now we move more to the geopolitical realm. And in fact, that Israel can and is, can be and is a positive force in the world. So the church has to deal with um, 
how to support Israel, but in a way that's rooted in justice and truth. So this does not mean a Christian Zionism that says everything that Israel does is right and everything the Palestinians do is wrong. Certainly not. So there must be a concern for justice and truth. But while affirming God's fidelity to his, his people, at the same time calling Israel to her vocation to holiness. So we are this is related to the next one. Both Jews and Christians now live in a very secularized world where many people, Jews and Christians, have lost their own story. They have lost uh, their own identity as created in the image and likeness of God. And so how can Jews and Christians together point to the hope in, uh, in God, to the forgiveness that is found in God, and our vocation to, to holiness and to, uh, to happiness in uh, in uh, by through communion with God. So there remain a few open questions, uh, some big open questions that are by no means resolved. So, what is Israel's vocation for the for the Catholic or Christian theologian? So Jews will have very particular answers to that. So, what is the role of Israel and of the Jewish people in God's plan of salvation uh, for Christians? And Christians should have the humility to not just come up with their own theories, but to ask Jews. You know. What do you think? What is your, your vocation as a, as a people of God? So I've already mentioned the hot potato issue of mission. How should the church express her missionary calling to the Jewish people today? Of course, Jews would say probably not at all. Just don't do it. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a tough topic, how to respectfully engage in dialogue without proselytizing, but without kind of uh, betraying our own faith. The whole question of Jewish Christians, we also have many Jewish Christians, some call themselves Messianic Jews. We have Jewish Catholics too, some are perhaps uh, in the audience here. So how should Jewish Christians or Jewish Catholics live out their Jewish identity, remaining faithful to their uh, heritage um, as Jews? And another big question, how should Catholics relate to the Torah and to the mitzvot, to the commandments? A big part of Christian apologetics was to say, well, uh, the Torah is no, no longer valid because now Jesus gave us the New Testament. And we know that Jesus refutes that interpretation himself. In Matthew 5, 17, he says, do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. Uh, so that's another complex issue for another day. Question of Zionism. So what's the significance of the land of Israel and the return of the Jewish people there? What should Christians make of that? We now have a large... Uh, movement of Christian Zionists who very much support the state of Israel. Uh, a lot less Catholics, but certainly there's no reason why Catholics cannot be Zionists, because we, as we saw, that if God's covenant with the Jewish people is irrevocable, well, the land of Israel is certainly a big part of that covenant. And also eschatology, what is Israel's ultimate destiny in the world, in a world that is becoming more and more secularized and, as I said, uh, turning away from God. So that's what I have for today. Uh, we recall Esau and Jacob. We know that uh, Jacob fled from Esau, fearing that Esau would kill him. So whoever is Jacob, well, in this case, let's say that Jacob is Israel. We know that the story does end well, that Jacob returns to, uh, to the land of Canaan, and Esau and Jacob embrace and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. So there is a reconciliation of Jacob and Esau in the book of Genesis. And uh, thanks be to God, we have seen very much happen as far as reconciliation goes between uh, Jews and Christians, starting or propelled by the Second Vatican Council, and as Benedict says, working for the genuine and lasting reconciliation between Christians and Jews. So there is still much work to be done, but I think there are good reasons to be grateful for, um, for a lot of progress done in the last 50, 60, 70 years. So thank you very much. I'm going to assume you're all applauding with a standing ovation. I'm just kidding. Uh, so I believe it's the time for questions. Let's see. All right. I have unshared. No, I am now unsharing my screen. Okay. All right. I'm getting some very funny, excellent joke. Thank you. I'm just seeing your comments now in case you wrote earlier. Good. Thank you very much for your kind comments. Now we have a Q&A. So you can enter your questions on, um, I guess you have a section for, for Q&A. So let me see. 
Okay. All right, I'm going to start with a short one, and the last one. Does the church believe you can know God without knowing Jesus? Uh, from uh, Charlotte. Um, a very good question. Does the church, so I know you have the saying in Judaism, like two Jews, three opinions. Uh, they don't usually say that of Catholics, because we have a Pope who tends to, uh, to unify uh, uh, kind of the, the, the beliefs. So I don't know if we can say two Catholics, three opinions, but you will find many opinions on, on this idea. Does the church believe you can know God without knowing Jesus? So I guess I'll give you the most, I guess, faithful answer I can give, judging from my understanding of Catholic theology. Probably the church would say you can partially know God. Uh, from a Christian perspective, a Catholic perspective, it's not like you're, 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 Obviously, as I say, you're cursed or you cannot, you can know nothing about God. So some, some fundamentalist groups would say you can know nothing about God unless you believe in Jesus. So the church would have a more, more nuanced approach. Uh, the church would say, certainly you can know God, and that's why the, the church encourages Catholics to study Judaism. Uh, the church would probably say you cannot know the, uh, the fullness of God, because if God became man, if God was... Um, if Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, then you would miss out on something very important about God's revelation. So the short answer, uh, which is, I mean, it's a tough question. And again, how to get uh, hated on all sides. So the church would, would say partially, you, you can know God. And in fact, in my experience, let me turn this into something more testimonial and perhaps less uh, controversial. In my experience in Israel, I went to many Shabbat meals and I met, uh, had made many uh, good Jewish friends, both secular and religious, and uh, I learned a lot by with through and through my Jewish friends. And so, there's no question to me that uh, that there there is to to use kind of the evangelical language of a relationship that is possible, absolutely, to have a relationship with God and to know God. Uh, though Christians would say you are missing something something pretty significant if Jesus was in fact the Messiah. So I'm not giving you the polit politically correct answer. Uh, but that would probably be the, the best answer I can, can give. Uh, okay, let me backtrack on earlier answers. If in Christianity, sin entered with Adam, but in Judaism, it's through Cain. Interesting. What are the implications of this difference? Uh, I'm not actually that familiar with the idea of sin entering through Cain. I know that Judaism downplays the idea of original sin. Um, Judaism tends to focus more on the fact that we can be good if we choose to. And so I'm not sure I can really answer that, the difference between Adam and Cain, what are the, the differences um, between both. But significant, more significant, I think, is this uh, kind of downplaying of original sin, which makes sense because Christianity says uh, there is something inherently broken in us that we can't repair on our own, and therefore we need the Messiah. Whereas Jews say we don't believe the Messiah came, so therefore we... Uh, we can still be good and we can still live a good life. So original sin is not so much a thing in, in Judaism. Okay, um, let's see. Do different Jewish groups from Aaron have any major popular interpretation of the prophecy given in Jeremiah, given at the beginning of the presentation? So Jeremiah 31, the prophecy of the new covenant. Good question. Uh, probably the Jews in the audience would be better placed to, to answer that. In my experience, 12 years in Israel and talking to a lot of Jews, unless you're a scholar, most Jews are just not aware of that prophecy. They think it's a New Testament uh, a thing. So, uh, and those who do, they would say, well, it's a prophecy of putting the Torah in our hearts. It's not a prophecy of starting a new religion. So they would say that, well, Christianity can't fulfill the new covenant prophecy because Christianity started a new religion that was hostile to Judaism. But the new covenant of Jeremiah really means a new covenant for, for the Jews. So again, I don't have much feedback. I don't know if I'm actually, uh, uh, if, if you guys are nodding or happy with my answers, so I'll bear for your indulgence. Okay, a question from David Reed. Does the consistent and persistent representation of Jesus as having white Anglo-Saxon features contribute to the ease of anti-Semitic hate? That is, if Jesus were represented as properly Semitic, how would Christianity deal with it? 
Very good question. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more artwork that portrays Jesus as truly a, uh, as, as a Jew, as a, as a Middle Eastern man, right? Uh, yeah, some of the more, more traditional picture is a little bit ridiculous where Jesus looks like a Norwegian. Um, I'm not sure if, if that would make a big difference. Maybe we would hope we, we should really do everything we can to uh, basically rehabilitate uh, Jesus as a, as a good Jew. What can still be done to make relations better? Well, that's a huge question. I think education is, is a big thing. I think dialogue, talking to one another. You know, I've been involved in this for, for, for a long time now. And I have seen that um, even in Jerusalem, like I said, living side by side with Jews and Christians, people can literally be neighbors and be completely ignorant of the other. I still see I'm around Catholics all the time who kind of know their faith, but they know very little at all about Judaism. And so I think it, it pays to like talk to people who actually know their faith and, uh, and get to know what they actually believe. You know, they're good people on both sides. I think uh, Christians, as I said, have much to learn about, uh, about you know, Jews uh, and the way they are, uh, in the way that they live their faith today. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. One more, all right. Um, okay, uh, tough question. Many very good questions. Uh, does the church see the hand of God in the reestablishment of the state of Israel? So the church is very cautious with endorsing Zionism because there are many Christians in the Middle East who, um, if you make this big pro-Zionist statement, we know what can happen for Christians living in Muslim uh, areas. It can cost them their life. So uh, theological truth is important, but you don't want to be responsible for the death of people too. And unfortunately, some segments of, of the Islamic world are not too friendly towards um, support of Zionism. And that in fact has happened in the past when Pope Benedict made a statement um, about Mohammed a while back. Um, it did cost some lives. And so the church is very prudent with that. I would like them personally to do a little more because I think it's an essential element of, uh, of our faith. But um, we can always pray and work. And, uh, and uh, if you know Catholics, you know, speak about this, about the, uh, if God's gifts and calling to the Jewish people are irrevocable, well, that must include the land of Israel in some way. So I would love to continue, but I think I'm getting the cue that uh, we should wrap things up. So shall I hand it over back to you, Marty? Please do. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how to switch these screens. I'm hoping Cole can do that somehow. Can you hear me? Ah, there I am. Uh, I would like to thank you all so very much for coming. Um, I found it to be a, a deeply moving and certainly enlightening lecture. Uh, I, I hope you did as well. Uh, I suspect I'll be hearing from many of you. And I, I certainly hope that you will be uh, willing to come to our next lecture, once again, by uh, Naftali Aklam, which is uh, Being Black, Jewish, and Israeli, on September 23rd at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, th this is uh, a peculiar way to do these things. Uh, I miss shaking your hands. I miss hugging you. I. I, I I miss seeing your smiles and hearing your laughter, as, as did Andre. Uh, uh, and by the way, I thought Andre was really quite funny, and, um, and I enjoyed the lecture a great, great deal. Thank I, you. I hope to see you all again in, in the very near future, and um, you know, next year in Ypsilanti. And l'shana uh, tova to all of you. And shana tova. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming. I, I may add too, if you're interested, I know that was really a lot of information and much of that you'll find on the, uh, the Catholics for Israel website, including very similar presentations that this was like a condensed version. I don't know, I know it's hard to believe, but this was a condensed version of, of a lot of the material that I've taught in courses. So catholicsforisrael.com. And we'll be posting it, as I said, both on our YouTube site and with a link, I think on, um, on our Facebook, uh, Eastern Michigan University Center for Jewish Studies. Have a wonderful night. Andre, you are a mensch of the highest order, and I thank you so very much.
Thank you very much for coming. Take good care, everyone. Good night.